all week, this theme kept recurring to me, the gift of simple conversation. The ability to communicate meaningfully between two people, voice to voice and face to face. It's something to treasure. We held Joy Natoli's memorial service in the sanctuary on Thursday. She was a longtime member of the church, our church secretary for a time, and the partner of Bob Fitzgerald, here with us today. Joy Natoli lived her name, we were told, at church retreats at Glastonbury Abbey on adventures around the globe, serving as a Peace Corps volunteer in Malawi, Africa, savoring excellent music. But as time wore on, she began to suffer from dementia, perhaps Alzheimer's, and the old ways of conversation with Joy grew harder. When her daughter moved her to Hawaii, it became harder still for those of us in Boston to share adventure the same way, exchange ideas, conversation, meaningful exchange between two people. Of course, it didn't end entirely. Humans always know when we're loved and valued, even if the specifics aren't quite clear. I've heard a story from one of you that when her husband couldn't recognize her anymore, he said something like this, I, I know this is a very important person who loves me. Our eyes can still speak. The tone of our voice can still communicate. Joy's daughter wrote that before she melted into a sleep state, Joy Natoli opened her eyes from her unresponsive place and held my gaze for what seemed like an eternity and I knew she was saying goodbye. Being able to have a conversation with another person, especially when we can use words, hear one another's tone of voice, be with them in person, see their eyes, it's a remarkable privilege. And it strikes us with special force at life's end. I've been seeing the miracle of conversation from the vantage point of the very beginning of life, too because my husband Bob cares daily for our infant granddaughter at the parsonage. She's a little over three months old now, and it's as if we're watching the trees and flowers bud this spring. Daily, if we're attentive, we notice a little more growth. I don't think I saw it when I was raising my own children, so sleep deprived, but this time around, I am aware that newborns really cannot volitionally smile or even make sounds. What I interpreted as a smile at first was undoubtedly just a gas grimace, and the sounds from my children's mouth were pure instinct initially. But that does change, of course, and conversation begins. A meaningful exchange between the baby and another person, a smile. You look her right in the eye now, and you'll elicit a beaming smile in return. And when you hold that gaze and that smile and then our words coax from her sounds that she's choosing to make now, back and forth between us. It's a whole new skill the baby has. But if I look away, or if my eyes have a distant, rather distracted look, rather than one of full and attentive love, then her special sounds and smiles just end. Babies know when we're fully engaged. Conversation, the meaningful exchange between people, when we are fully engaged, it's such a gift. Do we treasure it while we have it? This remarkable human ability to just have a conversation. Of course, all conversations are not pleasant. Some are brutal and leave scars. And at least for me, even this week, I know that fear can prevent me from picking up the phone or suggesting a get together in person. It seems easier somehow to email or text or avoid the hard topic altogether until I've figured out maybe exactly what I want to say. And isn't it worlds easier to talk about someone than to talk to them? And if we ever do engage, it's far easier to talk at them than to really listen. We humans are remarkably multi-talented, not only gifted with this profound ability to have conversations, but also with amazing rationales for avoiding them. Philip and the Ethiopian could easily have avoided their conversation. A rational person could have come up with any number of reasons it would never work. 
Philip is first mentioned in the book of Acts when the early church is forming. Philip was not one of the original 12 disciples. He's a Hellenist, a Greek-speaking disciple who comes on the scene when a conflict breaks out in the church. I know it's hard to believe conflict in church among people who all love God. Some people are so discouraged by church conflicts, but since we're all human, differences are inevitable. And the question is how we try to resolve them. And the conflict that involved Philip back then, the Hellenists have complained that their poor aren't getting as much in the food line as the Hebrew-speaking poor. Peter and the other disciples explain that they really cannot personally wait tables because, well, they're called to pray and to teach and to sort out what happened on Easter. How do we explain it? But they ask, might there be others suited to this task? People, they say, who are filled with wisdom and with that same godly spirit that filled Jesus. Maybe it'll be a mix of like a hospitality and community action board all put together. And so a nominating committee is appointed and an annual meeting is held and the first caregiving team is selected and Philip is among them. The Ethiopian, though, he's a very different man, it seems, certainly not a table waiter. The Ethiopian is a royal court official in charge of the Ethiopian, Ethiopian queen's entire treasury. He is rich to own a whole scroll of Isaiah by himself, usually held only in a temple. He is riding a chariot rather than walking, and he is clearly highly educated because he can read. The Ethiopian is a sexual minority, a eunuch, a castrated man, perhaps by birth, by accident, or perhaps because as a requirement of his office, working very closely with women, including the queen, he must be castrated. Whatever the cause, temple law, has at points kept people like him out, calling them impure, though interpretations vary. The prophet Isaiah himself, who he is reading, foretells a time when eunuchs will be embraced fully, joyfully. The Ethiopian is likely dark black, the color of those living in the distant south, 2,000 miles away. He's a visible foreigner, immediately distinguished from the Greeks or Hebrew-speaking Jews in dress and speech. But it seems he's familiar with Judaism and perhaps even very devout. He has just completed a long spiritual pilgrimage to Jerusalem and is now returning home, still avidly studying those scriptures. But, but, but could the Ethiopian and Philip really be expected to engage in a meaningful conversation? Logically, we could come up with so many reasons that could keep, keep the two apart. And by the way, never mind that the Ethiopian's chariot is about to pass Philip on the right. The Ethiopian perhaps never even seen Philip so caught up in his reading. But Philip, a man of wisdom, and filled with that same God spirit as Jesus jogs over and says, do you understand what you're reading? How can I, it responds the Ethiopian, unless I am guided. In a way, isn't this how meaningful conversations always starts? Someone agree that they'll, agrees that they will understand better, better if others also explore the perplexing thing with them. It could be the perplexing scripture or the situation or some conundrum. One offers to help and another accepts. The Ethiopian wasn't indignant or offended. I don't need your advice, but he was open. He even asked questions even listened. I have loved seeing this at King's Chapel this year, and my heart has sung. We've taken on three hot topics, a bylaw change concerning how new members join, a bylaw change to the words of our covenant, and a proposal to collectively, as a whole congregation, focus on three community partners so that we can deepen our connections to them and develop meaningful conversations and relationships with them. Of those three topics, of course we've had many different opinions and concerns, but on all three we keep coming back to have conversations time and again. I saw you listen, I saw you ask questions, I saw you change your minds. The proposals themselves were altered based on the feedback. It wasn't decision-making by a small group of people. 
your minister or a warden. In fact, I think that's how it's always been done here at King's Chapel, in the moments when we have progressed the most fully. Think about it. When James Freeman came to be the reader of the prayer book after the Revolutionary War, and he proposed massive changes. He preached about them, and then the question was, would people agree? And so line by line, they looked at the prayer book, accepting some of his ideas, voting others down. It was done as community. The same way in 1920, when this church went from having only people who owned the pews getting a right to vote. There were a number of women in the church, and after many years, they urged upon the vestry, and it was adopted, that those who participate regularly in worship here, not just those who own the pews, can vote. And so the Society of King's Chapel was formed. It's decision-making by everyone here. So this time around, it hasn't been enough to shoot emails out. We had people all come to one place and look into each other's faces and to hear the tone of each other's voice, to both speak and listen. And through this process, we were going stronger as a community of love. It took months, and of course it wasn't perfect. But what I've noticed is that even those unhappy with some of the outcomes, if they have participated in the communal conversations, well, they've understood them better and accepted a decision that might be disappointing to them. Why? Because it turns out we're not just voting on a specific issue, but we're having meaningful conversations about what this place means to us, how we want to save this special community that we have, and also want to welcome all, even if they bring some new ideas, how we want to honor our history and at the same time, be a vital, beloved church community today in 2018. How we want to respect each other's individual choices of how to serve God as their individual conscience dictates, and want to strengthen our communal ties by working together on some shared initiatives where we deepen our relationships not only between ourselves but with city partners, those who strengthen and work in the Roxbury community, those who support victims of violence, those who honor the homeless on Boston Common. About whom is Isaiah speaking? The Ethiopian asked Philip. He wanted to know who was it who was led like a lamb to the slaughter, who was humiliated and disgraced, and yet further on, who was it that we can't imagine had more yet to come? So Philip starts talking and he shares his ideas about Jesus. And I'm sure he shared ideas about his own life, the life of a table waiter. And now apparently himself someone called upon to share a message of love as surely as Peter had been. What do you think the Ethiopian did? Must he have shared about his own life, about the journey he's just taken to the temple and been welcomed or maybe excluded, we don't know about his own pain and humiliation despite his stature and riches, we don't know but can only imagine. But this is what we are told. Because of their conversation together, two unlikely strangers right there, able to look one another in the eye, hear one another's tones of voices, when they got to a spot of water on the desert road, the powerful treasurer of Ethiopia asked Philip, the wait person, does anything prevent me from being baptized? Can I be a member too? Am I included in the covenant? And finally, no words were needed. We're not told of anything being said. The conversation, the partnership had moved them on to something deeper. Two people looking in each other's eyes with the love of God. And then water splashing in, of all places, the desert. And oh, the rejoicing that followed conversations, times together to talk and listen, learn and grow. What a gift we have. Amen.